Hello, and welcome to Let's Talk Love. Today, I shared a conversation with Dr. Stan Tatkin. Stan is a prolific author and researcher. He is a professor at UCLA and maintains a private therapy practice in Southern California. Today, we are focused on Stan's book, Wired for Love. It is a guide to understanding your partner's brain and presents tools that can help improve any relationship, especially intimate partnerships. I appreciate Stan's work on teaching people to adopt what he calls secure functioning principles of behavior, all based on a fusion of neuroscience, attachment theory, and his many years of clinical experience as a therapist. Stan also has a terrific sense of humor. I hope you enjoy and learn from our conversation. Our guest today, Stan Tatkin. Stan, thank you for joining us. Hey, Robin, how are you? <laughs> I'm just wonderful, thank you. We just celebrated our Thanksgiving here in Canada this weekend. So oh, that's right. Had, yeah, Canada. had a long weekend and time with family, and it's, it was beautiful. Happy Thanksgiving. Yeah. I know Canada <laughs> has all these holidays. But, um, we, we used to teach there, and, uh, and, and, and Tracy, my wife, had to uh, make accommodations for, you know, for all the, the holidays that you folks have. Can't yes, I, I guess we, I guess we do. Yeah. <laughs> so Stan, before we um, go into talking about your book and your TED talk, and um, I would like to ask you a question I ask all of my guests, sure. which is what in your life right now is giving you the most joy? And what is one of your biggest challenges you're facing in your life right now? Well, let's see. Um, aging is one of the greatest challenges. I'll work uh, <laughs> backwards there. Uh, yeah. And one of the greatest joys is I, I think um, my life with Tracy, my my wife, and my daughter's over here too, Joanna. They're doing something today. Let me turn that off so that doesn't happen. Um, and and I, I I I'm I'm very happy uh, in my life today. That's beautiful. So, yeah. Yeah. I love that. Can you give us some some background, Stan, as to how you became a clinician and an author and you've done, you're a couples therapist and you've created um, your school and your courses and what led you down this path of doing the research and the way you, oh, you know, sure. you're teaching now about relationships and yeah. Um, well, uh, I started off as a musician when I was a kid. Um, came from a musical family. And so I was a professional musician until 26. And I didn't uh, start going back to school until I was 29. So I was a late bloomer. And wow. uh, once once I went back to school and quit music, I'm, I never looked back. I ended up falling in love with this field. So I've been through a lot of different iterations of my career, my you know professional work. Um, and ended up in couples um, because before that I was working or tried to work with mother-infant pairs or uh, infant caregiver pairs mm -hmm. uh, to do prevention work, but nobody would come. And so I had a hard time getting a clientele uh, at that point. So I shifted into adult pair bonding and found that, uh, that uh, pretty much uh, is a very similar thing when it comes to attachment and arousal regulation. And, you know, I'd already been studying psychobiology, infant brain development and so on. So it was natural for me. Um, and then I just started uh, working with couples and I'm, I am still doing prevention work because dealing with couples also helps children. Mm -hmm. So it works out. Yes, of course. And so I finished reading your book, Wired for Love. It oh, was thanks. really, really great. It was a great book. I learned a lot. And I, I and every week I interview um, a new expert about relationships. And I, I've, I'm constantly learning more and more. And I think, um, tell, tell us the reason you wrote Wired for Love, because it is different, you know, in a lot of ways than, you know, um, working through your, your, there is a definitely a section on working through conflict, which is inevitable in any relationship. Um, but you, you're diving into the neuroscience yes. and you're integrating attachment theory right. and you're bringing in biology of human arousal. So That's right. tell us how, how all of these, how you, how or why you wrote Wired for Love. 
I, you know, uh, uh, first of all, I'm in a couple, so I have a personal hmm. interest. Uh, also, I went through a divorce, which was an extremely painful experience for me before I, uh, you know, uh, married Tracy, who's my current wife, someone I've known actually since seventh grade science. Um, wow. But, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, uh, it, I, I think when, when we go through a trauma like divorce, mm -hmm. uh, there's not for everybody, but for many of us, there's a, a constant um, trying to figure out why, you know, why d did that happen? And what did I do? And uh, what do I need to learn and understand about that? And so, you know, I confess that a lot of this was also about a personal journey of mm -hmm. making, um, learning from my mistakes and dealing with regret. And Tracy, both of us come from having previous marriages and learning from them. And I think together we have um, crafted what I call secure functioning relationship. And so it's as much of a, uh, a, a sort of an academic process, a creative burst that I had, uh, you know, uh, in around 2003 when I was, I just couldn't stop thinking about integrating all that I had been learning up to that point and, uh, and putting that together with why my marriage failed and why this marriage has succeeded. So it's, you know, all that to say, I don't really know how I did this. Um, it's been a kind of a journey of passion, uh, I never figured on writing books. Well, I did actually. My father wrote and I thought maybe I'd write one book <laughs> um, just to do that. Mm -hmm. But yeah. <laughs> uh, I never would have dreamed, you know, writing nine, which now yes. uh, with the new book that's coming out will be nine. And so, wow. so it's just being swept away, I think, by my interest, my passion and the way my mind works and, uh, and, and loving to teach. So I'm a teacher, mm -hmm. and this started off with my teaching therapists how to work with a psychobiological approach. And that's basically the mind and the body working developmentally, starting with infant brain development throughout the lifespan. And so, um, and so I found that I just loved the whole process of learning and teaching and applying this in my practice. And one thing led to another that... Um, uh, you know, that this kind of carried me through much more complexity. Even today, I know more about what I'm thinking about and writing about that I did in Wire for Love uh, today than I did at that time. So mm. it's, uh, it's a constant growth process for me, uh, as mm -hmm. well as my students and as well as uh, people who are reading um, about PACT. So, yeah, it's kind well, of... Well, I, I loved your... Yes. Well, I loved your TED talk as well. And you're so funny. Like you've got a really good sense of humor, which I really appreciate. So this is a big question, but I'm sure you get this a lot. And actually it's, it, it lends to you the title of your TED talk. What, why are relationships so difficult? <laughs> I know there's a lot of reasons why, but that's a big question, right? Because we're human primates and human yes. primates are essentially, and I don't get me wrong, I'm a fan of my seat of my species. Uh, but, um, <laughs> you know, we're, we're, we are by nature, uh, it's in our DNA, warlike creatures, aggressive and mm. self-centered and moody and fickle and opportunistic and easily influenced by groups and xenophobic. We're always aware of what's missing, which leads to disappointment. And we're always comparing and contrasting, which also leads to envy. And so what could possibly go wrong, right? And, <laughs> uh, uh, and so yeah. uh, relationships are necessary uh you know we have an existential need to be connected and bonded to at least one other person um but we also are troubled uh, i won't say troubled but we're messy animals we're smart in so many ways smarter than any other animal that we know of in the planet and yet incredibly stupid when it comes to <laughs> relationships um mm. 
And uh, a lot of it has to do with the way the, the human brain operates. <coughs> Bless you. Thank um, you. You know, people really don't understand that, uh, you know, that, that we have, uh, you know, problems with communication. That's across the board. Uh, uh, terrible communication when it comes to uh, speech and understanding. Our memories are terrible on any given day, not reliable, and our perceptions are constantly changing according to our state of mind. Hmm. Add to that, we're threat animals. And so we're really good at picking up threat cues in our environment. And those threat cues will will increase um, if we actually get hurt. So um, that is a function of memory. Everything we do is a function of memory. We're memory animals. So uh, uh, this then can lead to problems in our interactions, close interactions with others, uh, where we're misunderstanding each other without realizing it, where we are getting into memory fights uh, unnecessarily, uh, mm -hmm. where we feel threatened by a look, by a gesture, by a word or a phrase, uh, or uh, you know, a vocal tone. Add to that, our um, our uh, relationships in terms of romantic relationships are what we call primary attachment uh, systems, right? Those are the hardest relationships, I think, on the planet because we're part um, new strangers um, in a symmetrical relationship, but we're always referring, our memories are always referring back to our original uh, caregivers and our original uh, family of origin, which was asymmetric. And so we uh, tend to come to these unions with a lot of entitlements, um, expectations, and also a certain amount of, um, of uh, informality um, because we think we're family when we uh, start to uh, get committed to each other. And that's a, that's a mistake, right? So we make a lot of mistakes in these kinds of relationships that we don't in other relationships. Um, mm. And also it has a very long memory. So you and I in a relationship of that kind are proxies really for everybody else that came before. No other relationship does that uh, as consistently as the primary uh, romantic relationship. Mm-hmm. I loved the introduction of your book, um, which Harville Hendricks wrote. Yes. And he, well, he talked, it was, it, Harville's fantastic. And he talked yes. about, um, you know, the brief history of partnership and how yeah. marriage, marriages have had, of course, it, reiterations, um, and incarnations, right? Where like he's, he's talking about marriage now as like almost like a fourth incarnation. Yeah. And now it's, it, it's like the now, which is what you're talking about, is a conscious partnership, which yeah. is is very new considering the history of marriage, right? And the other yeah. thing that I learned a lot about is is just um, how we're so wired, like you talk about in your book, is we're wired for war, not more, more in our brains, more versus love, right? So you're teaching how to you're teaching us how to come from that more loving, conscious, aware place. Yes. And it's like the, it's the, but where, and where, and how to get that, how to get there is, is like really making effort and being conscious of this we rather than yeah. I. That is, a, yeah. that, that I think, can we talk about that, please, Dan? The I oh, versus yeah. we and, <laughs> yeah. Uh, w w you know, we're dependency animals. Um, um, we pair bond in herds and, uh, you know, we live in a culture that denies our dependency needs, but we are, in fact, uh, dependency uh, type creatures. In the adult realm, uh, when getting into, in a free society, getting into uh, a union, an alliance, um, a relationship with another adult, we assume, and it should be this, that we have equal power and authority. We come uh, as a symmetrical unit not based on love or emotion, hopefully. It's based on terms and conditions, deal or no deal. And these systems, if they're, be, if they're to be compared to other unions in a free society, are based on 
shared purpose, shared vision, a shared sense of ethics and morality, um, a shared uh, you know, set of principles by which ha- how we're going to govern each other. Otherwise, unions of all kind will, uh, will disintegrate if they don't operate under principles of fairness, justice, and mutual sensitivity. Um, and most relationships um, have trouble with this. People aren't thinking about this. And so they break down because of too much unfairness, too much injustice, too much insensitivity, too much of the time. And, um, and that will cause the dissolution of, of any group, uh, whether it's a team or it's a, you know, a, a cop car partnership or it's a business, uh, you know, um, or a sports, you know, uh, couple that, that are, you know, ice skating team. This idea of a two-person psychological system um, is necessary for the care and maintenance of a union of the kind we're talking about. However, most of us revert to a one-person system of me, my, and I, and you, 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 under the slightest amount of stress. Actually, sometimes we're that way Mm. no matter what. So two-person thinking is a necessary condition for interdependency. Interdependency Mm -hmm. means that you and I are uh, entering a union where we both have the exact same things to gain and the exact same things to lose, which holds us accountable to each other because uh, we're equal shareholders. It must be that way or there will be resentment, right? Mm -hmm. And most people don't understand this. You know, we, we get together because of love, because of religion, because of attraction, because, uh, you know, uh, the biological clock is ticking uh, because our family wants us or, uh, you know, uh, it's an arranged marriage, whatever. But, uh, but we don't come uh, together thinking in the same way as we do other unions. And that's, uh, that can be a fatal error mm-hmm. when it comes to this idea of we do. Um, this is what we do. This is what we never do. So say us both. In other words, I expect partners to co-create from the ground up their relationship architecture, their culture, not the one they grew up with and not somebody else's, but theirs uh, in particular. And that takes a lot of thinking. That takes a lot of working together and co-constructing policies, principles, ways that we're going to mitigate um, and protect us from each other and our human nature, which, by the way, if I didn't make it clear, is not that great. Yes. And so <laughs> you, you, you break down, um, our, you know, cause there's, there's so much about neuroscience in your book, right? And just understanding the human mind and how we, yeah. we just operate. And you break it down, you break our minds down in between primitives and ambassadors. And you did touch on this in your TED talk, but can you please give us an example of how the brain is wired in relationships and differentiate between those two? Well, the, the, the primitives and, and the ambassadors is another way of saying, you know, uh, uh, and thinking fast and slow, Daniel Kahneman's um, system one, system two. I mean, in neuroscience, this is talked about quite a bit, that there are, uh, you know, two systems of operation. One is automatic, tends to be uh, what we know in our gut, uh, what we already know uh, in terms of our knowledge base. And it is, uh, is the kind of thinking that is impulsive, spontaneous, definitely there when we are feeling stressed. We revert to this, uh, this uh, uh, primitive system that is lightning fast based on memory, um, is survival oriented, reflexive and automatic. So it's uh, very, very um, energy conserving when it comes to having to think, but it makes a lot of mistakes. Um, The ambassadors, or what Kahneman would call system two, is our expensive, you know, um, thinking that takes up a lot of uh, energy and a lot of uh, caloric energy to operate. It is what we uh, do when we're in a novel situation. We use use the ambassadors when we have to think um, about what we're doing or consider the options or use critical thinking. That is also the ambassadors error correcting 
um, our, uh, our somatic experience in the moment um, by, you know, telling ourselves, uh, this would be the conscious telling ourselves, but the error correcting is done unconsciously. But let's say, let's say you uh, uh, put your head down and that reminds me of being dismissed, um, uh, reminds me of being dismissed. But then I uh, can tell myself, well, that's just a memory. That's not really true. You could be mm -hmm. thinking about something. You could be looking at your shoelaces. You could be looking down at your paper. It has nothing to do with me whatsoever. And so in that time, I error correct. I calm myself down. I regulate myself with uh, the ambassadors, right? Um, uh, so primitives are, are what we all use. And especially as soon as our heart rates or blood pressure go up to a certain level, we become much more automatic, reflexive, and memory-based. We shoot first and ask questions later. And this is what gets us into trouble. Mm-hmm. So, um, let's go through some, we don't have, we don't have time to go through all of the principles, but there, there are, I think 10 guiding principles to creating conscious partnership. I probably forgot are, them by now. I'm just, yes, I'm just no. now, um, New Harbinger has asked me to, to rewrite uh, a revised version. Really? Of, of, yes. Oh, excellent. So, uh, so I just got the copy of the book today. I'm going to go through it and probably prune a lot out and add a lot of new things. So yeah, the ten. Well, we could. And I would love. I would love it. Whatever you think, um, you'd like <laughs> to add to the conversation. But one of the one of the guiding principles is to create a couple bubble. W yes. Would that be a revision? <laughs> I don't think so. No, because <laughs> no, I think no. it's a very very important principle is to have your couple bubble. So Can you yeah, explain couple, that to us? Absolutely. Um, uh, the cup of bubble is basically, uh, you know, just a clever idea, image that you and I are primary attachment partners. Therefore, as primaries, neither of us are going to suffer or like being secondary or tertiary or being demoted, right? We occupy yep. a very special place. And there's something here that's biological that seems universal that we kind of expect that, even in polyamorous and polygamous uh, cultures. Uh, and so th that system has to be protected from the environment, protected mm -hmm. from what we call thirds. Um, third is anything outside of the orbit of that primary system, uh, which exists, right, in nature always. Mm -hmm. Um, but the way that uh, you and I operate in order to protect our safety and security system, we have to have certain principles or ideas that, uh, that do that, protect our union. And that would be putting our relationship first, uh, above and beyond everything and everyone else. Why? Because if we are, um, if, if we are in charge of everything and everyone, including each other, we have to have the same information. The left and right hand has to know what they're doing. Uh, we need uh, information in order to do business, in order to know each other. We have to be able to protect each other in public and private um, so as not to injure each other. Um, we have to make other arrangements that protect our system, our union, our alliance, from uh, from being degraded either from within by uh, creating a problem with uh, either of us and not taking care of it right away or from outside by other things, tasks, people, and so on. This is just about survival here. This is about protecting the union um, from each other and everyone else. Yeah. That's the couple bubble. And, uh, and, and it's a necessary thing to protect relationships in the law in short and long run. So there is, you, you talk about thirds and you just mentioned it, Stan, about how, I mean, anybody, all there's, there's things and people that could um, act as a third. That's and right. I mean, obviously children would be thirds, yeah. right? <laughs> or fourth or fifth or sixth, <laughs> depending on how many children you have. X, X's, uh, and I imagine, uh, and I, I think you, I think you do say this in your book, but I also imagine in your practice that you have, uh, you're dealing with couples who their couple bubble is absolutely under threat because of their differences in how they raise, you know, they want to raise their kids or if there's something yeah. going on with this child and it's just bringing up a lot of challenge between in the couple. 
And so how is it? And I, and I understand the principles, Dan, about how, you know, your union comes first over, you know, but your children are your children, right? And if you have yeah. differences of how do you, how do you manage that with couples that are having well, um, huge challenges with, with children? And of course their children coming, um, it kind of threatening the bubble. <laughs> yeah. Um, what I meant by putting the relationship first doesn't mean you, you put your, your kids in a closet with a bowl of kibble. No, of course you, not. You know, go jetting off, you know, to somewhere. Um, it, all it means is that because we're, uh, we're in charge of everyone and everything as a team, everyone, including our children, depends on us being in good shape. Yes. Um, therefore, we have to be in good order. Otherwise, we're not as effective. We're not going to be as good at our work, at creativity, at parenting, at self-care. All sorts of things are going to fail. And so everyone and everything is depending on you and I to be good. Um, to be, uh, to get along and to be good leaders. Um, that's what yes. parenting is, is leadership. And so that's what I mean. That's, it's, it's a practical hierarchical way of organizing a system so that we know, uh, what our task is, is very different than everybody else's. Okay. That's what that means. Um, but, uh, but children, um, um, are our third, uh, of course, and their job, of course, is to split you and I, um, even when they're <laughs> young. They're going to do that. Our job is to not allow uh, anything or anyone to split us. Um, otherwise, uh, you and I will get into a fight, and that's not good. So, um, so uh, that you and I are different is actually a feature, not a bug. Nature is uh, uh, basically wants us to have at least two caregivers, maybe more, because a child needs uh, different caregivers in order to enrich the developing brain. So uh, uh, viva la différence, right? That's never a problem. You and I have different, different styles. But the problem will be is that um, we're, not, uh, we're not thinking of our shared vision do we both want mm. to raise uh, children that are healthy? Yes. Do we both want them to be good citizens? Yes. Do we want them to be able to stand up for themselves? Yes. Do we want them to be able to uh, deal with a variety of difficult people and situations without giving up? Yes. And so on and so on. So we agree on our vision for this couple's project, which is to grow children up and prepare them for the real world because they're just passing through. We don't own them. It's a couple's project. That we are different um, is, again, something that you and I work on as we go as an improvisation. Parenting is, a, is an improv. Therefore, we're constantly shaping our approach to get the vision accomplished. Neither of us are experts. Neither of us are going to be perfect. We're both going to make mistakes and be wrong. That's fine. But it's a process, like all couples uh, projects, that we are constantly working as collaborators and cooperating with each other. Each of us generals, right? We're both generals. But if, when generals uh, fight or argue, soldiers die. We can't afford mm. to do that. So we have to work together, uh, and that's in all things. Otherwise, we don't produce anything. We don't get anything accomplished. We don't solve any problems. We don't create anything new. We're too busy arguing, yeah. and that's not yes. uh, smart, right? So we're talking about a two-person psychological system of, of us and we. Um, we have to work things out constantly that's good for me and good for you or it will uh cause us a problem and that's yeah. a two-person psychology system and one of the ways that you um coach couples is to learn how to please and soothe your partner right yeah. um is and really that's it's really it's the big the bigger foundation is really knowing getting to know your partner on those deep deep levels and so yes. actually i was i was um intrigued to learn you you had a different way to talk about attachment styles so you you yes. talk about an anchor a wave or an island 
And I don't know if you've yes. updated those those either, but I thought it no, was a was really no easy no kind of kind. No, I don't think so because I think it was quite an like an easy way to understand yeah. um, how we could we how we could have developed our attachments or what, what you would how you would define attachment styles. Um, and so you want to know that about your partner, whether they're, whether you and identify as an anchor or, or yes, if you identify, can you just go quickly, go through the anchor wave and Island for us? All this uh, attachment is, is basically a subjective sense of safety and security starting from infancy. So, and yeah. going throughout, throughout the, uh, uh, the lifespan. And it especially refers to dependency relationships. So you and I are dating and our attachment systems are not really an issue because, we don't, uh, we're, we don't, we're not, we don't feel permanent. I, I don't feel like you're depending on me yet and I'm not depending on you. Mm. But as soon as that begins to emerge, that's when we remember what it is like to depend on someone. And that can go all the way back to childhood. If our experience in dependency made us feel insecure, that is, I either had to give up my independence and autonomy, or I had to give up my secure base and feeling that I could, I could cling and, and actually have my dependency needs met. Either of those two uh, um, uh, situations um, will lead to insecure attachment. And that's a memory, basically, of threat. Threat, mm -hmm. a small t threat. And so what happens if I am... Uh, afraid of engulfment. I'm afraid of being taken over, my independence being taken from me, my stuff being taken from me. Um, then I will uh, defend myself in a particular way to protect myself that will look very unfriendly to you. And that will uh, in itself cause uh, problems in our uh, in our relationship because I'm distancing, I'm, I'm devaluing of attachment values. I am, uh, you know, keeping things to myself. I don't express myself. I don't engage. I distance. I, I, I flee before uh, I think about engaging. Um, I'm conflict avoidant. Uh, there's all sorts of features that are a part and parcel of this developmental trajectory. And having studied babies, uh, as I have, it's not rocket science. It actually makes mm -hmm. a lot of sense. This is just yes. an adaptation to our culture that we grew up in. If I'm somebody who uh, was, uh, you know, expected to stay young and dependent, and I had a parent who was there, but then not there, and I, I started to cling, um, and then I would be rejected and sometimes punished, then I am going to protect myself also by kind of distancing and clinging and um, always testing you to see if you really love me and, you know, putting you through the ringer and being negativistic when you're positive by pushing you away, all to protect myself from being rejected and abandoned. So an insecure attachment is not, uh, is not um, a, a no vote for relationship. It just makes relationship more challenging because mm -hmm. of a set of fears that are, that are causing me to behave in ways that are not collaborative or cooperative in a relationship. That's what it is. And so knowing this about you, I understand your movements and I understand your gestures and what you're doing. And instead of making you worse, I know how to actually uh, um, help, help you heal that, uh, that problem um, by knowing what to do most of the time. Uh, and the same with uh, uh, myself. If I am an island and I distance, I cannot be in a relationship with you without understanding that I am such an animal and that my behaviors, while suiting me uh, in lots of ways, are not pro-social, are not going to work hmm. in any adult <laughs> relationship. They worked when I was a kid, but they won't work in any adult romantic relationship. Therefore, I have to rein myself in. So it's, mm -hmm. it's really important to know this for, for, the, uh, for the self because um, I, if I behave the way I am accustomed to, I'm not going to be able to be in a relationship without threatening my partner or feeling yes. threatened all the time myself. Uh, and that's what, that's the only value it actually has. But make no mistake, just being a human being is a problem. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, we, don't need to be, we don't need to be an island anchor or wave. An anchor is yeah. it's someone who is secure, but uh, someone who's secure is still a pain in the ass. Mm-hmm. Human beings are disappointing, contradictory, annoying, um, irritating, and a burden up close. That is just the way we are. All people. Yes. Yes. And that, there's nothing wrong with that, but uh, we shouldn't be surprised. Uh, yeah. That's not the problem. Uh, the problem is is being threatening or f- feeling unsafe or insecure in a relationship because of behavior. That's the problem. Yes, and you said this is like that's exactly what you're you're just saying. Is like it's fine to be annoying because we're all annoying, <laughs> but it's when it, when it's threatening. Yeah. Yes, when, when it's when it's threatening the the safety and security of the relationship. That's where, right? right? You, you said that um, Dr. Gottman, who's done yeah. so much research on this, he said the oh, number one job. predictor of divorce is contempt. Which well, yeah. is um, and threatening the relationship, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna upgrade that. Um, it, it, um, contempt actually isn't. Um, there are several um, there are several top reasons why people divorce. One is that they never built their structure. They are flying a plane that's not fully built. They do not know what their principles are. They do not have a culture and ethos. Because they never sat down to do one, they just they just go on as if nothing uh, you know, nothing could go wrong. Uh, that's the major problem: no architecture, no structure, uh, no agreements, and no permission to govern each other. That's the name, number one. The second problem is um, is the manner in which all of us interact when one or both of us are under stress. As soon as we do that, we we revert to a one-person system that is uh, pro-self and not pro-social. It is not, it's a solo Mm. sport in that sense, uh, rather than a team sport. And I'm no longer thinking of you at the same time I'm considering my interests. That Mm. always reads as unfriendly, and then you and I go to war. That is how it works, and that's the biggest the biggest problem. We don't understand the primacy of this relationship. We mismanage thirds. We don't tell each other everything, breaking uh, a uh, uh, the premise that the greatest um, the greatest commodity in a relationship of this kind is the free flow of information. Without that, we can't do anything. And then, if one of us discover information that the that that person should have known in the past, that creates a trauma and a betrayal situation that's very hard to recover from. So Mm. the messiness by which we think about relationships, the naivety, the unwillingness to work and, and see the future and put together something that's based on purpose, not feeling, but purpose that holds us to account. Those are the reasons that uh, all relationships, no matter romantic or not, will dissolve in time. Wow. And so the reverse is true. (laughs) <laughs> um, the way to protect a relationship, whether family or lover or you know, business partner, uh, is to constantly um, be thinking in this way. I have to take care of myself and you at the same time or there will be trouble. That's the formula. Really simple and really hard to do. Yes. Yes. So one of the things you talk about in the book, which I thought was great too, is like, there's so many, there's so many good tips in here. So many great principles. So sleeping and waking separately. I didn't think this would have such a huge impact, but it does make sense to me that, um, can you talk about that? There's studies around this, right? Yes. Where it has, it has to do with, uh, uh, you know, um, in sort of in our DNA as uh, co-sleepers, right? Uh, We do better when we sleep together, when we, uh, put each other to bed and, and wake each other up. We just do better. We know this is true with children. They need uh, they need, need midwifing um, from wakefulness to sleep. We read to them. We tuck them in. We talk to them uh, because it's scary. We're ending the day and we're basically going into a near death experience of unconsciousness, right? And that's a little um, foreboding for us as children, but adults too. And then we need to be launched in the morning, woken up, you know, uh, with smiles, kisses, hugs, and so on. We have rituals that help us launch in the day. Otherwise, we run Mm -hmm. out of energy. And so 
um, uh, we fail to realize that as adults, we have the same need uh, because we deny this. We think, oh, I don't really care. You, you can go to sleep whenever you want. And we can acclimate to that. But once we do start to co-sleep, we become very aware when our partner isn't there and mm -hmm. we don't like it. Um, uh, you know, and so, uh, all things being equal, which they rarely are, is it better to co-sleep, go to sleep together and wake up together? Yes. All you have to do is try it for a few days and you can tell for yourself whether it's better. Um, uh, but then there are problems with snoring and restless leg and, you know, sleep cycles are different. Um, all of that can be actually, you know, uh, remedied. Most of it can be remedied. But even if you can't, you still can put each other to bed and then go off and do what you're going to do. And yes, still, I really liked that. Uh, I li like that idea. Bed. Yes. Yeah. Are you said just a, you can be walk up to the bedroom and hug and kiss. Good night. Love you. I'll be back. I'll be, I'll be in bed in a few hours. There is, yeah. there's a ritual there. I really, I, I really appreciated that idea. Um, and you, you know, you've, you've built, you talk about the idea about how rituals really are very important in couple, in, in a partnership. Um, and you, yes. you've got the welcome home ritual. I mean, it is, these are things that you can implement in your life, in your partnership that aren't difficult to do, but really do make a big impact, right? Absolutely. And, and, and again, the welcome home exercise is still the same thing as, uh, as, um, putting each other to bed. Um, um, our species is, is quite sensitive to separations and reunions. Uh, you may deny that, but if we hooked you up uh, in a certain way, um, or if we did, uh, you know, uh, some kind of um, uh, glucocortical um, uh, steroid uh, read of your urine and blood, we'd find that you there'd be stress hormones when you separate and, re and reunite. So we do have uh, um, a sensitivity there, whether we like it or not. So the welcome home exercise is a ritual where no matter what, we're going to uh, we're going to hug first. We're going to embrace first, greet each other first before the kids and the children as a ritual. Because we represent the big bells in the house, they're the little bells, everything rings to us. And uh, in, on a neurobiological level, um, we uh, uh, embrace or look into each other's eyes for a few moments to regulate, co-regulate each other, um, because we're coming together in two different states. One person's outside, one person's inside, one person may be revved up, the other person calm, and then we smack into each other. Mm. If we reunite it properly, um, uh, the environment would uh, change for us. Perception changes because we're averaging each other out automatically with the eye contact sustained or an embrace just for a minute. And you, people can just try this for themselves as a science experiment and see if I'm you know, wrong about this. So again, same principle um, of, of uh, reuniting properly, separating properly. But the reason we have rituals is because um, we're so damn lazy as a species, we would never do anything good for ourselves or each other if we didn't have rituals. Rituals mm -hmm. are a decision to do something, whether we feel like it or not, because we decided it improves our lifestyle. It improves our, our daily sense of living well, whether it's taking the shoes off when we come in or praying at dinner or whatever it is that we do. These rituals are, are meant to be pro-social and bring us together and ground us. Otherwise, um, we wouldn't do anything. And that's mm. the truth of it. That's what religious principles are for. That's what um, home principles or whatever you, you build as a ritual. Uh, we must have rituals or we will never do anything that's good. Yeah. So you're, I, I, I love this other tip around you know, you talk about arguing and fighting and how it's um, obviously inevitable in any partnership, right? Oh, yes. That you're going to have conflict. Yeah. And, but there are, you know, there, there has to be rules of engagement <laughs> and then right. respect and just ways that you can handle conflict where it's about the we, not the I. And I think that's where you, there's, there's a lot of training that we all need to do so that it's like, yeah. it's not a battlefield. It's like, it's all about how can we come to a win-win and just those, that, that guiding principle right there. Right. Yeah. And, and actually I think people do need to be trained. 
Um, mm-hmm. We're trained if we're, uh, you know, we're learning to be a negotiator. We're trained if we're learning to be a physician dealing with a patient or a therapist with a patient. We're trained um, when we are uh, go into the armed forces, and um, it's a different kind of training. Uh, in special forces, uh, you're you are told that the person next to you is more important than you because they're going to save your life. And, um, and that's a culture that is based on interdependence, that, uh, that our survival depends on each other. Therefore, we become best friends. We become, uh, you know, experts on each other because our survival depends on it. So you and I are in the foxhole together. We're a survival team. We decide to pair up. We're a team, a union, hopefully based in survival first and foremost, uh, because we exist in a dangerous, unpredictable world. We can't be dangerous um, uh, because the world is. So we have to make sure we are safe and secure at all times. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. So like any other union or grouping where uh, where the survival is the main game, um, uh, it's important to be experts on each other because I'm, I'm in the foxhole with you. I have to know the animal I'm with. I have to know how to regulate you. What if you freak out? I'm not going to leave it to you. I need to handle you so that you can stay by my side and save my life. Um, it, right? Uh, mm. And so um, we know this when we're when the circumstance uh, forces us to do this. Right? Unfortunately, most couples don't realize that their uh, lives actually depend on each other in every which way. Uh, they take that for granted, and so they don't think that they have to really be experts on each other or that they have to work collaboratively and cooperatively or they won't make it. Um, but that is wow. the fact. Yes. So if I were, you know, I told uh, a couple sometimes, you know, if I, w- if I were allowed to bolt their legs together, the inside of their legs together for a month without being sued or go to jail, they would understand this whole idea. That this mm-hmm. is a culture of weism, of two-person think. It's a team sport. We have to move together or we don't go anywhere. And if we pull against each other, it hurts. Therefore, we have to think um, in ways that work for both of us or we can't get anything done. Nothing happens and we cease to survive. That is just the way it is. And, um, uh, and unfortunately, I can't do that. But that would, that would uh, I think, encapsulate and give somebody, uh, two people, the idea of, of secure functioning. It's not really an option. And it's mm-hmm. not a luxury. Uh, if couples don't operate this way, they're just not going to last. Or if they do, they won't be happy. We know mm-hmm. this for a fact. Uh, this works in this way in all unions and has since the beginning of time. Um, so it's, it's really a hard thing to reorient to this when we're unaccustomed to doing it. And like I said, there are many, uh, there are many barriers in the love, uh, relationship. One of which is our entitlements. Um, I shouldn't have to do that. I'd like you to be an expert on me, but I I shouldn't have to do this. Mm -hmm. Um, you know. Um, I shouldn't have to take care of you. I shouldn't have to be the one who's in, who is your handler, though I am. Um, I shouldn't, you know, ha- have to keep trying to know you because um, you are a stranger and we're strangers constantly trying to get to know each other. We are not family. And so uh, there are all sorts of barriers to our way of thinking in these situations as couples. Uh, we don't think we need to protect each other from each other, so we don't come up with guardrails that would keep us from acting out. Um, there are all sorts of uh, things that are a problem here, where um, if we behaved in this way in a, in, in a business, we'd be fired, or we'd be mm. kicked off the team, or we'd <laughs> be kicked out of the rock and roll band that we're in, because we are ruining uh, and disturbing the uh, the the goal and the mission and the shared vision of the team. Yeah. And so the idea when it comes to rewiring your brain's den before we close is 
is that, I mean, like you said, this, this is training, it's practice and it's about practice. rewire, like literally creating new pathways in our brain through our, through yeah. new behaviors and new ways of thinking. Is that right? And by doing that, these, that by is, implementing the all case. these changes. Yeah. No, the only way we can change, we're not changing who we are. You, you know, we no. don't go into a relationship to be changed. All we're doing is changing the way we do business. So I am who yeah. I am, right? And you accept me for who I am. I accept mm -hmm. you for who you are. Otherwise, it's unfair to choose you and to take you, right? Um, uh, uh, but we're, we're, um, we're, we are two separate animals that have a different history, different culture, different ideas, mindset. We are two different people. We're going to step on each other's toes. We're going to insult each other. We're going to hurt each other. We're going to uh, do things that are unfair. Um, that just because of th that, this is a fact. Therefore, we have to organize this in a way <laughs> that allows us to get along. Everyone has to do this. Everyone. And uh, uh, no exceptions. And so, and if we don't do this, then we are going to violate each other. We're going to create what's called threat memory, which accrues mm. over time um, and becomes a sort of a snowball effect where now all we're doing is litigating the past because we never took care of business. We didn't take care of things mm -hmm. in a timely fashion. We didn't repair quickly. We didn't um, make amends as we should have. And now we've accrued um, a lot of threat memory, which is going to make everything harder. Uh, that is the cascade that we have to watch out for. But it takes understanding that what I am saying here is an idea. It is not a skill set. The idea comes from understanding that you and I are bound to each other. Our, mm -hmm. our wagons are hitched. Our fates are tied. Therefore, we have to move and we have to work in a very particular way. Otherwise, we'll keep going to war and we'll never make it. We'll be those people in a, a potato sack race that never got off the start line because they're fighting. They're running in you different know? directions, or, but they're, they're, <laughs> yeah, it's or, not going to work. The couple that, or the couple that fell down the well, and now you look and you see two sets of skeleton bones there in position of fighting each other, and they just could not figure out how to go back to back to get out of that well. Instead, they fought. And yeah. there you have it. Uh, it's Darwinian. Nature doesn't care. Uh, you know, the road is paved or the graveyards are filled with partners who just don't get it. Yeah. We work together or we don't work. Yeah. Well, I've so enjoyed our conversation, Stan, and I love, um, I love your book. I love your TED talk. And I know you've got nine books. So you said you've got another one, a new one coming out soon, which is very exciting. Can you tell us yeah, a little bit about called, that or is it going to be yeah, well, a secret? Th there's, there's, there's one out now. It's been out called We Do um, mm -hmm. instead of I Do. We yes, do. we do. And um, great. Uh, and it's I a great it. title. And it's so I mean, this is exactly what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then the new one is coming out uh, in April next year is uh, it's a big book. It's called um, In Each Other's Care. Mm -hmm. And it's actually the first book um, that I know of that's organized by complaints. Uh, and so that's the book. Uh, uh, every section, every chapter oh, great. Uh, is organized <laughs> by complaints around finances, stepchildren, sex, money, uh, messiness, timeliness, uh, in-laws, uh, you name it. Oh, that's going to be fantastic. Well, I look forward to reading it. And Thank I look you. forward to our IG Live next, Dan. And I'm just so thankful Yay. for your time and all of your wisdom. And you're doing, you're doing beautiful work in the world. Please mark your calendars for April 15th, 2023, when we at Real Love Ready will be hosting an in-person relationship summit held in Vancouver, British Columbia, with world-renowned experts who will spend a full day teaching us how to love better and build stronger loving relationships. Buy your tickets at realloveready.com. We will see you there. Please visit realloveready.com to become a member of our community. Submit your relationship questions for our podcast experts at reallovereadypodcast at gmail.com. We read everything you send. Be sure to rate and review this podcast. Your feedback helps us get you the relationship advice and guidance you need. The Real Love Ready podcast is recorded and edited by Maya Anstey. 
Transcriptions by otter.ai and edited by Maya Anstey. We at Real Love Ready acknowledge and express gratitude for the Coast Salish people, the stewards of the land on which we work and play, and encourage everyone listening to take a moment to acknowledge and express gratitude for those that have stewarded and continue to steward the land that you live on as well.